Hello and welcome to the New Zealand Initiatives podcast. My name is Oliver Hartwig and today we are joined by Mark Honeybone. And Mark is a new member of the New Zealand Initiative. He is the owner and founder of Property Ventures in Auckland and it's great to have you with us on the podcast. Hi Mark. Uh, thank you Oliver. Great, great to be here and great to be a part of the, uh, the initiative. And great to have you on the podcast and actually I should also mention that you are a podcaster yourself. You have a property podcast, um, and maybe we should just um, start with that. You've been doing that for quite a while, right? Yeah, we, we started I started a New Zealand property podcast, as it's called, about seven years ago. In fact, I didn't know what a podcast was back then until <laughs> someone introduced me to it. And uh, we've been doing it sort of fairly regularly uh, since. So uh, even though a few have got done more than me now, we, we were the first of the, the property podcast in the country. So well, that's how we claim to fame. Well, I, I can definitely tell you that our podcast is a lot younger. We've only been onto it for about a year or so. So anyway, great to have you on the program because not just that you're a new member of the initiative, but you're also a practitioner in one of the fields in which the initiative has been working for many years. We've been working on the housing market, on planning, on development, on local government, local government finance. But you're a practitioner in the field. You're dealing a lot with property buyers, owners, developers. And I just wanted to feel the pulse of the market talking to you. Maybe just tell me a little bit about property ventures. What do you actually do with your company? Yeah, well, um, we, we certainly start off a little bit different, Oliver, than most real estate companies. We, um, I'm a mad, passionate property person, and, and, um, and hopefully that's what I can bring into the, the initiative is a bit of my passion about property and and seen that things are done well in the industry. Um, but we, we started, I, I started off as a one man band um, buyer's agency. So uh, I used to trade properties and then I progressed then from getting my license and starting a, well, probably the second or third buyer's agency companies in New Zealand. And then uh, about six years ago, six and a half years ago, I moved to Auckland. And at that stage, um, we, we had had people join me and we really, I guess, started doing real estate like the traditional real estate companies. Um, but I guess because of how we how we started, we, we still we still are quite different from the normal standard companies. We sell normal real estate like them, but because we used to only be a buyer's agency, and what I mean by that is we used to help just uh, mainly property investors find property, and that's what we did. So because we did that, uh, we still... We still do uh, podcasts and videos, sort of educational videos, and, and um, we look after our buyers differently than a standard real estate company out there, I guess. So we, we know how important they are in the process. Yes, we represent the vendor now, and that's who, who pays us. But a lot of people come to us, in particular developers or people who have a, a need to sell quickly, um, and we will get in there and then do the do the best we can. So so we started from the working for the purchases and uh but we now work for the vendors and i think we do a pretty good job of that so you said that you are very experienced in, in property market dealings and you've moved to auckland in 2015 but just over those last yeah. six years since you moved to auckland a lot of the features of the property market would have changed i mean mm. we've seen rapid mm. house price inflation of course in the last few years but we've also seen some significant changes in policy relating to the housing market yeah, uh, lot, yeah, a few policies changes, particularly the last four years, and that has certainly affected, um, or was affecting, you know, now um, progressed over the last four years, I suppose, but to now where there is a, a lot of changes in in the property investment community and how they how they think and how they deal and what they are doing now. Uh, I'm reasonably active in the Auckland Property Investor Association as well. Uh, used to be in the Marlborough one several years ago, uh, but then we we run a meeting every two. I run a meeting every two months in Ponsonby, and it's it's just a get together, but it's really good to get a gauge on how how they um, the property investors uh, to think. Uh, it was actually uh, very nice. Uh, the, the last meeting we did at Ponsonby, the um, act um, housing lady uh, called in to see see what the real people were, uh, are feeling about things. Um, so, uh, but yes, the, the policies have certainly had an impact and I have pretty strong feelings on, on what that's doing to us right now as a country. Now, for property investors, I assume the last few years would have been golden days with the property inflation that we have seen in the market. I mean, I came to New Zealand in 2012 
And in that time, I've seen the mm. price of our house basically double, and that was Wellington. Mm. For Auckland, I think for a long time, it was even crazier than that. But more mm. recently, I think property investors are feeling slightly different about the market because they're now feeling really the impact of the government's recent regulations. Yeah, well, in those six and a half years I've been there, which is pretty well the time in a couple more years since you arrived, I guess, is, um, there's been some really highs and lows. And, and I remember a year after I got here, so in, in 2016, um, it was that the, the market went one of the uh, craziest that I've seen it since I've been involved in, in property in the last 20 years. And it, it, it went up you know, 50% in a matter of about two years. And then the government brought in the 40% LVR rule for investors. And to be fair, it worked and it worked, worked pretty well. Uh, it did slow down investors. In fact, it stopped overnight. <laughs> um, places like Hamilton, I remember, we used to do, or we still do, a, a lot of uh, property deals. And Hamilton is one of our major parts of the country. We do our property deals. Uh, and overnight, uh, that stopped because um, you, know, you could investors were buying you know, $450,000, $400,000 investment properties uh, with only 20% needed. Uh, and, of course, once the 40% rules come in, that, that, that just stopped, um, yeah, stopped, stopped totally. And, and uh, my uh, agent down there was a wee bit worried for a while. He's, he's bounced back and doing particularly well. But what, what's more the important is the rules, which you alluded to before, in the last four years, we've had, as a property investor in New Zealand, we've had the healthy homes come in. Uh, we've now got need the heat pumps and, the, of course, the latest one, which is a uh, a real stinger for a lot of people is a loss of claiming interest as an expense, um, and that, that's that's big, and that's that's extremely big for a um, a, a property investor. And you know, on an average house of eight hundred thousand, which is roughly the the medium I saw today, uh, price come out. Um, yeah, that's about a so those three things all all, mm. all, all up is about a fifteen thousand dollar hit investors have made, but about eight thousand dollars a year. Um, and if the interest rates go up, that eight thousand a year will go up. Yeah, what, uh, I, I was just going to ask. Missing you. out on the difference of what they're missing out on. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask you if you could just talk us through all the various regulations that the government has put in place over the last few years. You've mentioned the loan to value ratios already; they've been in place for, correct me if I'm wrong, I think about three years now. Mm -hmm. um, we are expecting more regulations, I think, from the Reserve Bank, not just loan to value ratios, but in the future loan to income ratios. What's your take yes. on that? Now that's a um, well. That's going to hurt a lot of New Zealanders, to be fair. And um, I believe the rates about six to six to one. Some banks may be looking at seven to one, uh, which you know means if you have a, a family income of seven uh, of a hundred thousand dollars, you, you can only buy a, a property for six or seven hundred thousand. And I say only because if you live in Auckland, um, that's not going to get you very much. Um, if you uh, if you're living in in somewhere. Uh, else in a smaller town, New Zealand, and you've only got one income, you might be a sixty or seventy thousand dollar income. Yet you, you can't when you multiply that by six, you're not getting a, a very large um, um, a, a amount of money that you can you know you, uh, you can borrow from the bank. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of rules with that, and especially when as an investor, because then they take the they take the rent of the other properties uh, into consideration. There's a few extra factors they they are putting together for. Uh, for that, but that that's that's one thing that might really halt the prices of the market. It's it's really interesting because at one at one side of it, there's a real shortage of property right now. There's uh, the number of properties being sold are down. The prices are still going up, uh, and it's back to the simple supply and demand situation. Is um, so how we how they get the two mixes there together? I'm not sure how that that really going to pan out. Mm. So loan to value ratios already in, in place, loan to income ratios probably coming, some energy mm. regulations you've already mentioned, then we've got the interest mm. deductibility or rather non-deductibility, and then there's the bright line test as well. Yeah, well, I'd just like to, just like to go back in a couple of years also. The, the government were really trying to hit, I remember them talking, they were trying to um, penalise trade, property traders and property traders, these are speculators, these are um, you know, renovators, uh, people that uh, develop one into three places or, or you know, there's a whole, whole range of things. But they seem to think they were, they were the problem. And, and I, I was a trader before I became a real estate agent. And, um, and, and what it did, I say traders and I say 
the good and honest traders, which most of them are out there, they pay tax anyway, like anyone in the country. In fact, they probably pay more tax. If a trader renovates a property and makes $60,000 on a, say, a renovation property, which they're, they're making a non-tenanted property into a property where tenants can actually live, into, live in, uh, you know, they pay a third tax, they pay GST on, on that, and they have to pay real estate costs. So they only actually make about half the profit um, that, that looks like they're making sort of thing. So if they make, they make $60,000 gross, they're making $30,000, give or take $5,000. Uh, now they were trying to bring the bring these rules and capital gains tax and what have you to do that. Um, you know, that, that a part of the um, the funny thing is with the new rules they've brought in with the uh, not being able to claim interest on it as an expense anymore doesn't affect um, traders again because traders are like any other business in New Zealand uh, where you can obviously in a, in a, any interest you pay on any any money you have for your asset uh, you can claim back. So the only people that can't claim back is a property investor who holds a property and um, and a secondhand property at that. So it, it, it seems funny. So, so it, a few years ago, they were trying to hit traders. Nothing has hit a trader whatsoever. No none of, no rules they have brought in has hit a trader. Um, what it has done, it has hit the property investor that's trying to uh, provide you know good properties for New Zealand and um, and what's happening with the you know with costing the average investor fifteen thousand dollars a year per property and eight thousand a year moving forward, um, that, that's it's made it very very hard. I imagine that um, you would be talking with colleagues and competitors about these policy changes that you've experienced over the past few years. Do you or your colleagues and competitors have a feeling that you've been properly consulted with by the government, or did all of these changes basically come out of the blue? Yeah, um, simple answer, not at all. Uh, well, no, we haven't been consulted with. And um, I guess if we go back six or seven or eight years, we, I guess the government then at the time, they did consult with us uh, quite a lot. They consulted with Andrew King, who's the head of the Property Investor Association or Federation in New Zealand. And he, he was our, our voice and, and he came to us and we did, they did talk to us. But certainly the rules in the last four years, um, there's been no consulting whatsoever and if I'd like to explain what what that sort of means by the you know when I said before the investor it costs them eight thousand dollars a year from now on it's costing fifteen thousand um, yeah, dollars the, the the new rule of not claiming interest is going to be phased in over the next sort of four years so what we've seen already is many landlords are starting to sell many will wait for the next two three four years if they will uh, before they will sell um, and, and remember, these are avid New Zealanders that want to improve their wealth by owning a rental property. That's what everyone wants. Their dreams to own their own property and then to get a rental property. And um, and it's not becoming affordable for them. I just spoke to a real estate agent in Tauranga recently and said he knows of quite a few people around Tauranga who had a an apartment as a rental. And what they're doing now, they've sold their older, um, their older house they lived in and they moved back into their apartment or their, their, what was their rental which means um, those you know, those places now aren't for tenants um, and they've had to, had to move somewhere else. So, you know, where do they go? That's one of the, the questions. Mm. Um, and, and that is, I'd like to say, going to follow on from that is as more and more rentals are taken out of the market, um, you know, where are they going to go? You know, as I said, it hasn't, I'll say it hasn't started yet, but in fact it, it has started yet, but we're going to see it getting worse and worse in the next four years. Um and if they think if the government think there's a problem there of not enough rentals for tenants and not enough motels for uh, the tenants or um, people that need need them, uh, they better get the calculator out and start pushing the modification button because I, I see that's going to get dramatically worse in the next four years from now. So how would you describe the mood in the property investment community these days? Uh, well, immediately after the rules were announced, the most recent ones, there was a lot of confusion. Um, people were unsure what they were going to do. And interesting enough, the the trading or the renovation or, um, investors or community of investors, they are out there very active and, and that market's still still very hot. Um, and and I, guess, I guess there's nothing to really change, change for them. There's still a shortage of properties so people are still paying good money once they've renovated a property. Uh, so there, there's, um, and people are just saying, they are changing their strategy a little bit where, They've, they've made an incentive, incentivize investors going and buy new builds because 
or at the moment, you can claim um, interest. Uh, that are still deciding what to do there, which is also a wee bit confusing. Um, so there is a bit of bit of confusion. A little, there was a lot of anger uh, when the new rules come out, but like anything, you just have to adapt to what's in front of you. Um, but what I, I just see the biggest picture here is there's going to be less properties for tenants to live in, and you know, half of New Zealanders live in rented properties. And then, you know, what, what's that? What's that going to do? Um, yeah, there's a lot of, as I said before, a lot of investors now that mum and dad invest with one or two properties that can't afford to hold that property now. Now they've all made good, you know, they've all made good capital gains in the last couple of years. So people complain the investors made a lot of money there. But if you think of that, what that's meant is, um, you know, mum and dad investor has had great capital gains from their investment property, so they can then go and buy another one and uh, have another rental property for, a, for someone to live in. Um, but instead, what they're doing is they can't afford to hold that one because the cash flow is not good enough. They're selling their property and moving back into what they, what they have or move into their rental property and sell the other one. Uh, so in, in effect, there's one, potentially two rental properties less per person selling, if, you, if that makes sense. And um, as this happens more in the next four years when these rules come in 100%, um, I can see that happening more and more and just having less properties for, for tenants to live in. If you're looking around the rental market now or you know anyone looking at rental properties, um, there's a big shortage right now and, and that's only going to get worse. And you say the property shortage is only going to get worse also because of the difficulty of bringing new supply on stream. And I, I understand that you are dealing a lot with councils and you can see the practical difficulties of making development happen these days. <coughs> Yeah, well, that's a, a, a another topic, and, and we're just yeah we've been through an experience with a, a very frustrated developer, um, more so here to do with the, the council or the inconsistencies of, of councils. Um, we had a developer in Sunny Nook. Now Sunny Nook's about oh, 15 minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes north of the, the Harbour Bridge. Uh, can take 40 minutes by car, probably longer uh, to get to work if you live in the city, work in the city centre. Uh, about a 15 minute drive on a bus in the morning with the, the great bus lanes they do have on the North Shore. Um, so we had a developer looking at building 32 apartments. They had 16 one and 16 two bedrooms. They were extremely, they were close to the motorway and, and about a one minute walk to the, the main bus route to the city. Um, and the only other way is to, get, to go on the traffic with, with all the other cars on there. Um, so the main problem with this particular project was there's a creek close to the boundary. Uh, the developers said they'd move it right to the boundary. Um, they'll do everything they had to do. They'd have the appropriate brand new, you know, a brand new service to service a creek. Um, they'll plant the appropriate um, plants around it. And the pre-act meeting, it was signed off, and they said yes, that would probably happen if they can just carry out the appropriate measures to do that. Um, so, so it all looked quite good on the on the front of it. Uh, we started selling the pre-sales they needed on this particular uh, property, which was 12, 12 of them to be sold. Uh, we sold them very easily because it's in a, a great location. Uh, if we skip what happened from then to three weeks ago, about three weeks ago, uh, come out of New Zealand Herald stated how the council, Auckland Council, was encouraging developers to build as close as they can and as and a high density as they can, uh, close to train stations and bus services all around Auckland. Um, so they're encouraging partners and townhouses, which they're encouraging anyway. Um, so, so and, and keeping in mind, in recent years, the council has signed off a lot of very small one and two bedroom apartments, uh, complexes of five to sort of 12 properties without car parks. Um, and which annoys a lot of Aucklanders, but the, the, and to be fair, the, Council allows it, so the developers have done it. This this complex had 24 to 28. I can't think which it was now. Locked and safe in a um, a locked car area on the bottom floor of this this building. Uh, so the safe safe areas. Um, they were slightly bigger apartments in the standard one or two bedrooms. So again, they were they were perfect for what people wanted. Uh, and if we go back um, to two months earlier, so. They had their pre, pre-meeting at the council, said, yes, looks all good. Uh, we sold out the, what they wanted. Um, and the, also in the resource consent started taking a nasty turn. They had a new change of personnel in the, government, in the council that worked on the project and things seemed to go wrong. And they, they said, all of a sudden said no for a few reasons. Um, uh, they, 
they were council going back to the developer with requests that were either extremely vague or incorrect or or they wouldn't actually ask what they wanted the developer to do. They just said no, which was interesting. And um, in the last couple of months ago, the, um, or six weeks ago, uh, the council working off an old RMA paperwork. Now the, the rules changed in August 2020. The developer had to go and print off the changes um, from the, and give to the environmental department of the council that they didn't know about. And this had an effect on, on whether they'd have a hearing about it or not. Um, there's just a lot of um, there's a lot of issues of a lot of the ecology um, you're part of what, what the, the problems were but they never come back and gave gave answers they didn't give say what they wanted the developer would do anything to make it work uh, so they wouldn't quantify anything um, they wouldn't say what they needed to do uh, the council would say um, it's more than minor the effects are more than minor but they you know, they wouldn't wouldn't say what they wanted. The developer come back with a forty five page um, uh, document about the moving the stream and everything they needed to do. So now, one of one of the fun. ideas that we've developed here at the initiative over the years is to incentivize councils to become more development friendly. We thought if you give councils a greater share in the tax revenue generated out of mm. new development, they would probably behave slightly differently towards developers. Would mm. you agree with that? Well, that's what we see on a daily basis too, but in this case here, yeah, that didn't happen. They they didn't ask. He was wanting to give the council and, and um, grow trees where he had to grow trees and plants, and a lot of it was, at this particular place was a, a really messy and overgrown uh, property uh, that an eye, eye saw, and they wanted some plants to stay there. Um, but they just never told the developer what they wanted, and uh, exactly that the, they should be. They're incentivizing the developers to help, and most developers are wanting to help and make things better. Um, whether that's making, you know, water pipes around a town or a suburb better, or whatever, to help the whole the whole um, suburb, whatever that is, they're always wanting to help. But in this case here, it just didn't happen for some reason. So, so the funny result out of this one is we. Um, we we have twelve buyers that are, are pretty unhappy. They love the location because of the transport and shops and schools and and department stores and they had they all bought at reasonably good prices. And um, the owner's got a thirteen hundred square meter section they're paying rates for that the council now only said five hundred square meters of, it, of it's actually good, <laughs> um, according to the re- redevelopment part of the council. Um, even though they were quite happy to let the development go ahead at the start of it. Uh, so there's just a it just just seems it's there's just too many inconsistencies for my liking and, and a lot of people's liking. Um, we, we were sure we were with one common goal to, to get you know, what they said three weeks ago in the Herald, where they said they want properties exactly like this to go ahead. Uh, so anyway, there's my gripe for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you have um, definitely joined the right organization then because um, this is one thing that we would like to change with policy to create the right incentives so councils actually become a bit more positive and proactive about development. But mm. apart from that, um, just to finish off our conversation here, why did you join us? I mean, we're glad to have you on board, but maybe you could just tell us and tell our listeners what actually got you interested in the initiative and why you came on board. Yeah, it's an interesting because I'm, um, I, I don't come with the same intellect background as yourself and many of the, <laughs> the members in the group. Uh, the great thing about it, and I felt very welcome in the first meeting we had a couple of weeks ago, um, was I think if you're, you're, you're passionate about something enough, um, and, and what I really loved the other day, uh, that, that meeting two weeks ago when we were uh, together, you know, we saw you know 12 or 13 very high high powered, I'll just say, uh, you know, the top the top of their game of business in New Zealand, and they all really want to help uh, help New Zealanders and help the government do. What they should be doing, you know, doing well. Um, as I said before, um, consulting uh, professional uh, experts in a particular area before they go and make a policy. Um, you know, obviously, what I went through before, they obviously clearly didn't do that. The last, the last few policies they made in, in, in housing. Um, so, if I can come along and add any value for um, you know my little spectrum of what I'm, I'm passionate about, and then see and live in live and breathe and have for the last 15 years um, of, of property investment. Um, you know, if that helps some way, that's, uh, that's great. And in the meantime, I'm going to um, learn a lot from everyone else in that group. 
Well, thank you, Mark. It is great uh, to have you on board. It is great to have your perspective around the table at these meetings. But for now, thank you very much for joining us today for the podcast. And it was great to get your perspective on what's happening in the property market. Thanks, Oliver. And uh, great to be a part of it. And uh, you did a great job. Thank you. And thank you all for listening.